My name is Patrick Crutchley with the World Wellbeing Project at the University of Pennsylvania. This tutorial will cover regression and prediction in general, when and why penalization is necessary, especially for prediction from language, and will briefly discuss forms of penalization in use by the World Wellbeing Project and elsewhere. Regression is extremely common in almost every scientific discipline. A simple example is the relationship between human height and weight. Linear regression provides a model, a line of best fit, that describes this relationship. As height increases, so too does weight in general, with some noise. The relationship is not perfectly linear. The ordinary least squares linear regression has a closed form solution and can be calculated directly from the matrix of observations by features. It also provides a method for predicting one variable from the other. Say we have a person who is 190 centimeters tall. We go up from there to the line of best fit, and then left to see where that lands on the weight axis. The linear model that relates height and weight in these data would predict a weight of about 87 kilograms. But data are noisy. In the presence of noisy data, this process of fitting a model can go wrong. It's possible to fit the model to the noise instead of just the underlying relationship between variables. With, with variables like language, the problem is even harder, since we don't know what the underlying relationship is, if one even exists at all. But we'll start with a simple example with artificial data, where we know the relationship, we know that it's noisy, and how fitting a model to the noise results in a problem called overfitting. Put simply, overfitting results from using a model that is too complex for the input data. In this example, I've generated data where each observation's y value is just equal to the x value plus some noise. The underlying relationship is linear, though we're observing the actual relationship with noise. To get a better fit to the data, we can make the model more complicated. And that's reflected by the polynomial fit with more terms. The trend line is now closer to each data point, so a measure like mean squared error would get better for these data points. But since we know the function that produced these data, we can see how the more complicated model would perform on newly generated data points. If we saw a data point with an x value of, say, 0, the intercept of the polynomial would predict a, value, a y value of more than 10 whereas the linear fit intercept would be much closer to the actual expected value of zero. Remember that the data were generated from a y equals x linear function. That's how we check for overfitting. We train a model on some portion of the data, the training set, and test on another portion, which can be called a holdout set, a test set, or a validation set. When you repeat that process using every data point in the test, in the test set once, that's called n-fold cross-validation. Here, it's four-fold cross-validation since there are four folds. Each fold uses three-quarters of the data to train the model and one-quarter to test the model performance. So what does overfitting look like when your independent variables or features are based on language? Say we want to pre predict a personality trait like extroversion from someone's social media language. We know that this should be possible, since we can measure language that is correlated with this trait. In our PLOS One paper, we showed that the words, multi-word expressions, and topic clusters seen here are positively correlated with the Big Five extroversion trait. People took an inventory questionnaire to measure extroversion, and we correlated that inventory with their relative usage of these words, phrases, and topics. So, say we have four people who tweeted the following. And these are all made up. I made these up. Person 1 scored high on the extroversion trait and said, looking forward to graduation parties and hearing Lynn Manuel speak. Person 2 also scored high on extroversion and says, parties are the best. Who's going out this weekend? Person 3 scored low on extroversion and says, political parties in this country are a mess. Person 4 also scored low on extroversion and says, looking forward to a weekend of video games and not talking to anyone. Based on the correlation we res results we saw in the PLOS One paper and common sense, we might expect usage of the word parties to be a feature that predicts high extroversion. It was a word that was correlated with high extroversion in, in that paper. But language data are noisy. 
notice that while both highly extroverted people used the word, so did one of the low extroversion people. In other words, it's not a specific indicator of high extroversion. Weekend, which you might also think of as a predictive feature, in this made-up example doesn't do much better, since it's used by one highly extroverted person and one low extroverted person. What about the feature Lin Manuel, though? In this data, it's only used by an extroverted person, so should the model use that as a meaningful feature for predicting high extroversion? Probably not, right? If we saw a new person use that name or those words, we probably wouldn't have a good sense of where that person lies on the extroversion trait. It's not a word that, you know, common sense tells us would be correlated with, with extroversion. If we had much more data, we'd probably see that Lin Manual is used equally by high extroversion and low extroversion people, while a word like parties is more useful for predicting extroversion. More data can make up for the noise in the relationship. Just a side note here, when we build these models, the data look more like this. The first column here, extroverted, is our outcome variable, or dependent variable, what we're trying to predict. The other three columns are our independent variables, the features that we're going to use to try to predict the outcome. So what's the solution when you're in danger of fitting an overcomplicated model to the data, or overfitting? Penalize. Without any sort of penalty, the goal of regression is just to minimize error, which is the distance between the model and the observed data. Examples of error measures are the absolute value of error, or squared error, mean or median over data points. Mean squared error is a common measure. Remember that the complicated polynomial model from earlier has less error. The data points are on average closer to the model line. Penalized regression adds a term for model complexity to the error that the regression algorithm tries to minimize. Complexity and error are both bad, and the algorithm works to balance them. This is also known as the bias-variance bias trade-off. Penalized models take on some additional variance or error in order to reduce bias on out-of-sample data. So how do we measure overall model complexity? There are a few ways, usually defined in terms of different mathematical norms, often called L0, L1, and L2. As a penalty, L0 is simply a count of the number of non-zero coefficients, or in other words, the number of features that are going into the model. L1 penalty is the sum of absolute value of coefficients in the model. L2 penalty is the sum of squared coefficients in the model. So what effect do these penalties have on the models? Take this plot as a means of comparing the original coefficient values on the x-axis to what they become when the penalties are included on the y-axis. The blue dotted line is the y equals x unity line for purposes of comparison. The L0 penalty simply removes some features from the model. In this plot, we can see features that previously had coefficient values from negative 2 to positive 2 now have zero coefficients. They're no longer included in the model. The L0 penalty removes some features from the model, but importantly, doesn't affect the other feature coefficients. As a downside, this method tends to be inefficient. There is really no algorithm that can select the best features to keep in the model in this manner, and the error landscape is not convex, meaning that it's hard or impossible to arrive at the global best solution for predicting out-of-sample data. It is, however, useful to remove features of the model, especially when the number of features is higher, sometimes much higher than the number of observations. Think about the language personality prediction problem. We may have a thousand people in the data set, even 10,000 people in especially large data sets with both language and a personality score. In contrast, the possible features, oftentimes the lexicon of possible words that anyone in the sample has ever said, usually number at least in the tens of thousands of words. If we add in language features consisting of all possible two-word phrases or bigrams, the number of possible features grows dramatically, at least to possible feature counts in the millions. Adding all possible three-word phrases and other features increases it even more. For our regression model to provide accurate predictions, some of these features must be removed from the model entirely, so that the number of features is not dramatically larger than the number of observations. Fortunately, there are a number of 
other tricks that we use for removing features from regression models. The first is to do what we call a current selection of features, where we remove any we remove any feature that doesn't appear for a certain percentage of observations. So like words only said by a few people, we would take those out of possible consideration for uh, a prediction model. Or we can select features that are individually correlated with our outcome of interest. These would be like the words that appear in the plus one correlation findings. Uh, skipping L1 for now, on the other end of our, our penalty spectrum, we have the L2 penalty, which has the effect of reducing model coefficients by, by a factor. It reduces them proportionally. Linear regression with an L2 penalty is called ridge regression. So this means that high coefficients are penalized the most, and in contrast with L0, no features are removed from the model. A coefficient can only be zero after penalization if it was zero before the penalty. Also unlike L0, ridge regression with the L2 penalty has a closed form solution, similar to ordinary least squares. No optimization algorithm is necessary to find the ideal solution, the ideal coefficients for the model. This doesn't mean that it's always quick, since like linear regression, the closed form requires a matrix inversion that can be very slow with a large number of features. As mentioned, large coefficients have the largest decrease in magnitude and all features stay in the model. This is especially appropriate in a case where the feature space is small relative to the number of observations so that no feature selection is needed. An example of this might be when one's features are a topic model or somehow a dimensionally reduced set of language features. Uh, back to the L1 penalty. Regression using this penalty is also called lasso or sometimes pronounced lasso, sometimes uh, the word is all in all caps, and is newer than ridge, having been developed in the mid-90s by Robert Tibshirani. The coefficients all move towards zero by a fixed amount, not proportional like ridge regression. Any coefficient that was originally smaller in magnitude than that amount becomes zero. In that way, L1 penalization has both some feature selection like L0 and some uh, penalization, some uh, reduction in uh, magnitude of coefficient like L2. It also has the advantage of being relatively easy and quick to optimize. It's a convex problem, meaning that there's a global best solution, and minimum seeking algorithms like gradient descent can find that solution. As said, it does do some feature selections, so like L0, it's useful when the number of features is too large relative to the number of observations to get a clean predictive model. An additional option is to add more than one kind of penalty to a model. Adding both L1 and L2 penalties is a method called elastic net regularization. This combines the increased penalty on large coefficients of ridge regression with the removal of low coefficient features in lasso. So as you can see in the plot, the slope of the line is, is made somewhat more shallow, and the smaller uh, magnitude coefficients are decreased to zero. One thing you might have noticed me specifically not talking about is how the balance between penalty and error, or the bias-variance trade-off, is controlled. It's with a parameter in front of the penalty term, often denoted with the Greek lowercase letter alpha. This parameter controls the influence of the penalty relative to error and vice versa. Increasing this parameter will make in-sample training error larger, but up to a point will reduce bias in the model so that out-of-sample testing error gets smaller. And for a predictive model, that's what we really care about. Decreasing the regularization parameter makes the model closer to ordinary least squares regression. What parameter is best depends entirely on the data set in question, so finding the best one is usually done empirically, often through cross-validation. We tr can try a range of possible parameters and see which one predicts out-of-sample the best. Generally, we find a U-shaped curve and out-of-sample testing error versus regularization magnitude. On one end, when we're not regularizing or penalizing enough, we have overfitting, and on the other end, when we're over-penalizing, underfitting, the model isn't complex enough to capture whatever signal there is between the features and the outcome. 
Thank you for listening. This is a complex problem, especially model and parameter selection. I've really only scratched the surface with an introduction to prediction, what causes overfitting and why it's bad, and one strategy re to reduce it, and a few different types of penalties. Again, my name is Patrick Crutchley with the World Wellbeing Project at the University of Pennsylvania, and I hope this has been useful for you. Thank you again.